Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last day of the 2020 Jetscape Summer School. Uh, today, we will have the hands-on continuation of the hands-on session on the, uh, the, the Bayesian analysis of the hard sector by Yi Chen. Uh, before we get started, um, and as I see, uh, people streaming in. I just wanted to remind you again that you know we Christine sent out an email yesterday uh, uh, regarding uh, the survey that we would like you to complete on Survey Monkey. Um, can we do a quick poll and can people uh, just vote on if they have done the survey? Just vote yes or no. I think Christine just sent you the link in the chat. And if you haven't, uh, I would like to take maybe 10 minutes at the beginning to, to sort of take the survey. Okay. Because uh, this is very important for us. Without this, we cannot you know, run schools like this. Uh, and it's important for our funding agency as well. So in case you have not taken the survey, click on the link in the chat uh, and take, take the first 10 minutes uh, and, and, and do the survey. And while you're taking the survey, I think I'll get a few other messages across. So I think E will start officially talking at 9.15. So you have 10 minutes uh, from now to just, just click on the link uh, in the chat and go to the survey. Um, there was a separate poll that we put in to vote on the, the most helpful participant. Uh, there are three candidates that are leading, but it'd be great if more people would vote. There haven't been that many votes in there. So uh, please take that uh, as soon as you can as well. Uh, so that we can identify uh, the three uh, students who had been most helpful uh, and come up and give them their three prizes. The other issue that um, uh, some of you have asked is about a conference uh, photo. And what we've suggested might be the easiest, there are two things we could do. Okay, so, so one thing is, um, is to just update your profile picture on the Slack. And we will, uh, once there are enough profile pictures updated, we can just download the Slack page and then with all the pictures in there uh, and that, that will become uh, a conference picture. So please just update a picture of you, as Christine said, with just head and soul shoulders, looking straight in, into the camera or to one side, whichever you prefer, that's fine. Uh, preferably with, with no other people in the, in, in, in the profile picture. Uh, the other thing that we were thinking we could do is to take a screenshot of the Zoom session with everybody's cameras turned on. Um, if that, uh, so that's something we, we will ask uh, at the end of the session today. So the session goes on from roughly from from the 15 past the hour and goes on for about an hour. And at the end of that, we will ask for uh, a, a, a screenshot of with everybody's cameras turned on. Um, so if you'd like to participate in that, uh, just you just have to turn your camera on for that, you know, one minute or two minutes while, while I take a screenshot. Um, but that's totally up to you. You can do it that way. Uh, if you, and if you don't want to turn your camera on, um, please update the, your profile picture on the, on the Slack. And if you don't want to keep the profile picture updated for too long, uh, and you'd rather use you know, some other icon, that's fine. You just, just maybe update the profile picture for a day and just let us know and just send us an email saying, you know, I'm going to take this down in, 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 so in a few days or something. So that takes care of the photos. So once again, there is a link in the chat session in Zoom for the survey on the school. It's very important for us. So please take the survey. And once you've taken the survey, click yes on Zoom 
that you've taken the survey. So far, I only see eight yeses and 10 noes. Uh, and we are just waiting for you until 9.15 to take the survey. Uh, once again, so I now see 13 yeses and 11 noes. The link is in the chat. Um, and while we have this forum open for the next five, six minutes, uh, is there any comments uh, from any of the chairs? Um, Christine? Yeah, so the comments, so the survey has multiple choice and multiple answer questions, but the comments are also really valuable. So this was the first time we did a school like this and there may be questions we didn't think to ask. So what worked well, what didn't work well, suggestions. You guys can also email us, but the survey monkey, monkey survey is anonymous. But comments are especially useful. Also on the most um, helpful participant, you guys can send us an email. And while the TAs and the instructors are not eligible for most helpful participant, I am certain that they would love to hear your thanks. So you, it'd be great. They worked really hard. So if you want to tell them thanks and shower them with praise in Slack, that would be fantastic. So while we are still uh, taking the other survey, let me just quickly share my screen and show you how you can vote for the most helpful participant. Let's see. Can people see my Slack screen? Yep. Christine, okay. So you all you have to do, um, what is going on over here? Uh, so all you do, let me see if I can shut this down. Nope, can I shut this down? Uh, you go in here and you look at the number in front of the participant. And so like Isaac is number one, James is number two, John is three, um, and so on. And you simply go up here and you, the, the drop down that says vote for, you just drop down and then you can vote for one, two, three, and the, each number corresponds to the name next to that number. If you don't see the name of the person uh, that you uh, that you are, want to vote for, then you can go to this button and just add the name of the person. And again, vote for them. Adding the name is like nominating somebody. It's not voting for them. Okay, so what I've, what I've seen is a lot of people have just added names of the same person again and again, and so what I've done is I've, I cannot remove something that you added, but I can change the name. So I've changed the names to do not click. So for example, this was, I think Isaac a second time. And so all I've done is just, just changed it out so, so that you don't click that number again. And that's happened a few times. So, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of these do not vote, do not vote on this number. So that's just the names that have been repeated. Uh, just go in and click on again. It's on the drop down, and just click on one of the numbers that corresponds to the to the person that you want to vote for. Okay. So for those who are still joining, uh, uh, just to let you know, we are taking a brief uh, pause before the start, so that people can go out and fill the online survey for the school. Uh, the survey is in the chat session um, in the Zoom, in the Zoom chat. So there's a link in the chat. You can just click the link and take the survey. So, so far we have 21 yeses and 10 noes. Um, can you resend the link? It's right above you in the chat. Christine, can you send it again in the link in the in the chat? Yeah, just a second. You can also go into the Slack channel and on the welcome, um, the the link to the um, to the survey is the second to last um, the second to last comment, and I just pinned it as well.
And then I copied and pasted it into the Zoom again. So once again, for those who are just joining, we are, uh, let me remind you again about the discussion on, on having a conference photo. We have said, uh, we've asked you to update your profile picture on, the, on Slack, and so that we can just download the Slack listing of, of participants and make that into a conference photo. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna try is at the end of the session today, uh, that's in an hour from now, we will ask you to just turn on your camera and then we will take a screenshot. Uh, so get ready for that. And again, if you don't want to participate in that, just update your picture on the, on the, on the, on the Slack profile. So you guys say, can we fill it by tomorrow? If not urgent, yes, you can fill it by tomorrow. Um, but um, yeah, but definitely do it. Uh, so we are getting up on 9.15. And so I think it's time for me to stop talking and hand it uh, off to the chairs and to E to start uh, the hands-on session. All right, thank you everybody. Yeah, I think there, there's not much left uh, for the chairs to say. So I think I'll, we'll, we'll just turn it over directly to Yi and uh, go ahead and start. Uh, I was muted, I think. Okay, so let's get started. So for today, uh, we will have a not so long uh, follow-up session. So it will last about one hour in total. And during this hour, I want to do two things. Uh, first thing is to uh, review, go over the homework with, with, with all of you to kind of go through it to, to see what what I was looking for. And for the second half of the hour, I will uh, go back to the slides and talk a little bit more about uh, the treatment of uncertainties in data. Okay, so let's start with the, the homework part. So as you can see, I already opened these things here. So. Uh, can we do a quick poll here to see if people get reasonable results from the homework? Uh, please press yes if you think you get something reasonable and no if you didn't get it or don't have time to, to try it yet. Yeah, since this, this is the first time uh, we will try something like this, so any feedback is welcome to adjust the difficulty or, or format. Let's see. Okay, we have a few yes and more no's. Okay. So uh, let, let me go, th go through it together with you and also, the, the answer will be posted, uh, will be uploaded to, uh, to the GitHub afterwards. So if you don't get it, uh, that's fine. We, we can always get it afterwards and, and see. Okay, so back to the homework uh, question. So the, the, the homework is uh, try to learn the parameters for the digit asymmetry. So the setup is that for each event, we have the leading two jets. Uh, jet one and jet two, and we can form the asymmetry observable like this, which is difference div divided by the sum. And uh, we will construct a very simple toy model to, to describe the energy loss uh, in this digit asymmetry. And the model goes as follows. 
So each jet can lose energy, and it's random. And the lost energy energy is prioritized as delta PT over PT equals uh, equals the Gaussian distribution of mean of A and width of B. And because there are also potentially third jet events and, and so on. And the effect on that is prioritized as a Gaussian smearing of AJ with a width of C on top of uh, this energy loss thing. And the measurement is done in two things. One's in central events where we have A, B, and C both relevant. And one in peripheral events where A and B doesn't exist and we only have C. Okay, uh, and the notebook here is to generate the, the data needed for do, to do this. Okay, so the first thing, uh, first blanks are how many design points we want. And this, you basically free to choose how many, however many you want. So I put hundreds uh, for now, but you can also put more or less. And the only thing that will happen if you put too little is that the result is not stable. And then for the prime ranges, uh, for this, I started with a huge range, like 10, 10, 10. And then I run the whole thing and found out that it's really too big. And I re then I reduced to 0 0.5. OK. And then there's then we come to the predict function, which is basically our, our model calculation, so to speak. So since we, we parameterize the uh, energy loss as delta PT over PT equals to a Gaussian, so the energy after quenching will be the initial energy times one minus the Gaussian distribution. And similarly for the, for the second jet. And this initial energy doesn't matter because in, in AJ, things cancel. And in this simple model, uh, there's no dependence on the, the jet ener initial jet energy. And then we have the AJ. And then the extra smearing is just a Gaussian smearing. OK. So this is the, the simple model that we are doing. And then to test the prediction, uh, we, there are two blocks here to make sure that we're running things more or less reasonably. So we can pick whatever we want here. For example, A equals 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.05, B 0 0.25, C 0 0.1, and then we run the predict. And you see that the prediction is each bin content will be like this, and the plot will be like this. So this is plotting AJ, and you see there's a width coming from all the smearing effects. And we can also change this to a small number, for example. And we see the things are on the more narrower. So these two are just to play around to see if things make sense. And we should see something like this. Uh, and then finally, uh, we do make the design points. So here we are using a random distribution, which is not the best thing to do. But in, in real problems, we can go on to more fancier solutions, like we can use the Latin hyperdue algorithms to sample things better. But for this simple example, the random distribution is good enough. OK, and then it comes to the model predict predictions. So first, we generate prediction for the central data. So basically, for each point in design, we calculate uh, the prediction, plugging A, B, and C. OK. And then for the peripheral data, uh, for each point in design, we're plugging only C and set A and B to zero because there's no quenching effect here. 
the, and then you run these three to to get the the data files. Okay, so let's pause a little bit to see if people have uh, questions on on these things. And after running these, you can see that the data files appeared in, in, in the folder on the right here. So you can see if everything looks more or less okay. Okay, so I don't see any outstanding questions on on Slack. Yeah, it's just just small things. Okay, it looks good. Okay, so I hope this is not too complicated uh, for for this part. Okay, then uh, then comes the second part, which is to do the learning. And for this, essentially, all that we have to do is to change the input file. Remember yesterday, th th these are the simple example something something. And we just changed the input file to the ones that we just created in the AJ homework directory. And then change the range to, to what you set uh, when you do the design points. Okay, and then we just run through everything and we can see if things make sense or not. Okay, so let's go through the, the printouts uh, on this sheet. So this is first we plot data. Uh, these are data look like for the two measurements. Uh, one in central on the left and one in peripheral on the right. So in the central collisions, you can see that things are wider compared to the peripheral collisions where things are narrower because, because of quenching effect. And then we can plot all the design points on top of data. So each line here is a one, the prediction for one design point. And yeah, so you see all of them and then there's the data somewhere in between. So the important thing to check here is that you should see the blue curves kind of enclose the red one. Otherwise you're, you're not hitting the mark for where data could be. Okay, then let's move on. Here's the distribution of the design points. It looks random, so it's okay. Uh, yeah, there's no obvious big holes here either, so, so that's good. And then finally, the input, uh, there's also the covariance matrix. So you can see here, there's the strong diagonal component, which is the statistical and the uncorrelated systematics. And then there's the some diffuse bins of diagonal term, which is the correlation across different bins in each data. Okay, so far so good. And then you just run everything and let's keep going. Okay, and then after you run everything, you can find the final three plots on analyzing the procedure. So first one is the MCMC sample as a function of steps. So here again, each plot is uh, A, B, and C as a function of steps in the MCMC chain. And each curve is one chain. So we run a lot of chains. And here, at least on the first sight, we don't see any significant behavior in the beginning. So everything is kind of uniform. And this tells us that the burning is probably good 
we don't need to include it, increase it too much. Okay, and then comes the posterior on the parameters. Uh, so you can see that this is what we get from, from learning the, on the data. So C is very well constrained because the, we have a whole peripheral data to constrain the C where A and B are zero. And then the, from the central data, we can constrain A and B. And because the absolute energy loss is not so important, so uh, we have better sensitivity in B compared to A, for example. And you can have fun with this. And the final check is to look at the posterior on top of data. So the, the blue curves are the posterior, uh, the predictions from the posterior samples. And the red dots are the, the data again. So you can see that even though beforehand, if we plot everything, it's kind of scattered all the, over the place for blue curves. After learning, uh, we get quite nice uh, constraints on A, B, and C. Okay, uh, let me pause a little bit again for questions. Okay, there's a request to to show the model for smearing. So let me go back here. So the model basically is this part plus this part. So there's a smearing, uh, Gaussian smearing of sigma equals to C, regardless of where you are. And then for central events, there's additional smearing coming from the, from the drift quenching effect. I don't see any outstanding questions. So, yeah, as I said before, I will, I will post uh, these answers on, on GitHub afterwards. So in case you miss some of the details, you can go back to check it. Um, I don't see any questions popping up. So uh, let me now move uh, to the slides and then we'll, we'll come back for, for questions afterwards if, if, if something shows up in the meantime. Okay. So uh, also please note that these slides are updated uh, since yesterday. So uh, if you use the link to yesterday, then that will not work. And please go to the info page and find the, the new file. Okay, so now the, the thing I want to talk about, uh, which was uh, not covered yesterday, is how do we deal with uncertainties in data? So I want to go a little bit more deeper into it. So when it comes to uncertainty, the really central question uh, is actually 
uh, what do you mean by uncertainty? And if you recall that the uncertainties are actually just descriptions to the full likelihood function. And usually we just get one number for an uncertainty or two if we're lucky and it's asymmetric. And so we, we, what we can only do is we guess the, how the likelihood function look like with some unsets. And uh, one popular guess that show up everywhere is uh, a kind of uh, Gaussian function with mean and RMS equal to what's reported by experiments. And so even with the Gaussian approximation, there are still uh, quite a few complications that we need to take into account. So for example, there could be correlations between different bins in the measurement. So suppose you measure RA as a function of PT, their uncertainty across for different PT bins will be correlated. And there could also be correlation between different systematics and also uh, between everything essentially, like between different measurements, between different experiments and so on and so forth. And if we want uh, these experimental data to be most efficiently used, the ideal case is that experiments provide these correlations directly so that uh, they tell you what the correlation should look like between different things. And here, the, the more, uh, if in case this is not there, then we have to make approximations. And the more approximations that we have to make, uh, the worse the result will be. And let's look at one uh, concrete example. So um, on this page, uh, I, I take a screenshot for the charge hedron RA from one of the experiments or one of the centrality things. So you can see that uh, here it is 10 to 30 percent and it's 5.02 GV, uh, TeV, collision energy. And this is the PT and the charge hydron IA. Okay. So now uh, we see that there are four columns for uncertainties. The first column here is the statistical uncertainty. And it's statistical, so it's uncorrelated from everything else. So this is good. <coughs> And then there's the other uncertainty, for example, there's the TA uncertainty. And this will be fully correlated across different bins and different experiments, uh, if you, they use the same population. There's also the luminosity uncertainty uh, from PP, usually. And this is correlated across different bins here and also across different centrality. Okay, and then there is, uh, unfortunately, there is also the other systematic column. So the, this uh, uncertainty is basically a number that characterizes how much the other systematics that, that enters this bit. So for this, uh, usually, uh, if you look into the analysis from the experiments, this number is a uh, sum of uh, many, many, many systemat different systematic sources with different amounts of correlations. And so for the outside world, they have uh, no way to, to, to know what the correlations are between these numbers. And this is one example that we have to have uh, make some approximations. There's just, there's just no way to know it unless it's provided directly. Okay, and uh, if you uh, make the, the previous table into the, the data file we have, then it will look like something like this. So you can see that all the different systematics will be its own in its own column. And we have different labels for different systematics.
Okay. And uh, another thing is that um, experimentally, uh, knowing the exact likelihood is, is very tricky. Uh, even if you are the main analyzer of some analysis. So it's not like the experiment will withheld information. It's usually is that it's just hard to get to, even uh, if you are doing analysis. So for one example, uh, in analysis, we usually see something like we vary something by some percentage, and then we call the difference in systematics. So how do we deal with this? So what actually is meant uh, by this statement is that there is some underlying likelihood function. And then the difference by varying this x here tells us something about the width of that function. And of course, you have, uh, you have either have to study more carefully how this function looks like, or you have to make some assumptions. And for those of us who are doing analysis, I think it's a very good exercise to think about these things for each source of systematic uncertainty, because otherwise it's not very well defined. And basically the better we can pin this down, the more useful the data will be for the community when people try to learn things from the data. And this is quite, it's quite important. Okay, so back to the, the case of the Jetscape statistical package. So um, ideally, the experiments will provide covariance matrix. And then there's a way to insert external covariance matrix into the stat package. They say you read in the matrix and then you just assign to the covariance uh, object. Uh, something like this. Okay, so this is the best case scenario. But unfortunately, we very, very rarely have the provided covariance matrix. We start to see some measurements uh, intending for NPDF fits to provide these, but unfortunately, they are still uh, in the minority. So what we instead we have to do uh, is to estimate the covariance matrix ourselves uh, from the information we have in hand. Okay, and the way to do it, as you see in the hands-on session, is, to, is by calling this reader.estimate covariance uh, function. So what this function it does is that it calculates the, estimates the covariance between two data sets, uh, uh, in this case, it's uh, data one versus data two. You can also get the diagonal term, like the covariance for each data by itself by putting the same thing here, data one, data one, okay? And then there are some assumptions that will have to list in the end. And one assumption is the systematic correlation length that was also asked yesterday what it is. And I will put the formula next in the next page. Okay, so the way it goes is that, so first we have the default correlation length of something. And then we can list as many sources as we want afterwards for the ones that we do know the correlation. Okay, so in this case, uh, uh, what this says is that for the luminosity systematics, we'll assume that things are fully correlated. And for everything else that's not specified, we assume a correlation length of 0 0.2. Okay. And uh, these labels correspond to the column name in data. So whatever you put as the column name there, you specify here, uh, it's one to one. Okay, uh, and this um, on this page, this is the actual 
formula for for using it uh, for for the systematic link. And so, for each source, we calculate this thing uh, for for each entry in the covariance matrix. So imagine first of all, imagine if uh, forget about the strength for now, and forget about the exponential part for now. Uh, in, in that in that case, what we have is just C i j equals to theta I, uh, sigma i times sigma j, which means that it's fully correlated. Okay, and then uh, for this we have a systematic strength modifier that we are able to specify. So this is a prefactor mo uh, multiplying in front of everything else. So one means that we don't change the strength of the correlation uh, the, of this source. And this is useful, for example, if you want to disable some of the systematic source temporarily, then you can put the strength for that to zero so that that source will not be counted in your analysis. And for example, if you are trying to understand the uh, how different systematic uncertainties impact your results, then this is a good thing to use. And then uh, we come to the systematic length uh, part, which is this exponential. Uh, so the formula is like this. So exponential minus the difference in the x coordinate divided by the systematic length to the 1.9 power. Uh, so the first of all, this 1.9 uh, it's actually more or less two. And we choose 1.9 because for reasons of numerical stability. Uh, to think about it, we can, to first order, think of it as two. It's not so much difference. And then the correlation length comes here in the denominator. So which means that this is the typical length scale of the correlation between different bins in one measurement. So you have, if you have two uh, points in the data that's very close to each other, then they will be more correlated compared to things that are far away from each other. And exactly how much correlated these are is controlled by this systematic length uh, number that we specify. Okay, and so basically if you want fully correlated, we set this to a very, very large number. If we want this to be fully uncorrelated, uh, we set this to a very small number and you can set negative number to specify that, for example. Okay, and if you want more full information, then please check uh, uh, the, the source code. There is a block of comments uh, explaining a bit in more details what, what is what and what's the default and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, let me pause a little bit. Uh, any questions so far on this part? People still hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, we we can hear you. Yeah, not not, uh, but not seeing any questions. I think, I think this is pretty clear. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So there, that's actually all uh, I prepared. So let me brief, give a brief summary of these two days. So, um, the summary uh, is that. First of all, the likelihood function is the, the central piece of all what we're doing, or closely uh, linked the posterior uh, function in the Bayesian formalism. And the numbers that we put in experimental physics are actually just the descriptions of the likelihood function or the posterior function, depending on how you want to think about it. And to analyze the posterior function, we can use uh, sampling methods which is realized using MCMC here. And we can build the function by interpolation because it takes a lot of time to evaluate likelihood for most cases. 
And the way we choose to do this is Gaussian process emulator. And finally, the systematic uncertainties are very tricky. And uh, usually we don't have access to the full library functions and we are forced to make approximations. And exactly how to do an approximation, that's a form of art. And the better we can do this, the, the better the, the data will, will be. Okay, so actually that's all I have prepared. I, I was anticipating a lot more questions. So uh, any final questions on, on the lecture for these two days? So in, in addition to the Slack channel, if you want to raise your hand in Zoom, just to, since we're not being inundated by questions. Other, other, otherwise, we'll assume every, everyone's uh, very happy with the, the presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, remember, you can always ask more questions afterwards on Slack if something comes up. The, the Slack will be open. Okay, so let me turn the floor back to Ron. Okay, thank, thank you, Yi, for another very uh, clear lecture and, uh, and uh, you know, a very appropriate exercise. It was nice to see an example of uh, calculating some, some physics with a very simple model. So that's, that's appreciated. Um, uh, let me, yeah, so I don't have much more to say, so I think I'm gonna turn it over to Abhijit or Christine to uh, close out the school and uh, maybe try the, the Zoom photo if you want to try. Abhijit? All right, Abhijit, so- 